and I can't cover everything, but I'm going to try to give you kind of the, the basics. I'm going to, we're going to talk about what types of disc findings we can, can be confused for uh, pathology. And uh, anybody who's rotated through neuro-ophthalmology knows that um, that's a big problem. Uh, we want to talk about the fe features of true papilledema, uh, tests you'd order to evaluate papilledema or work it up, uh, uh, talk about a differential <coughs> diagnosis, and then possible treatments, medical and surgical. Uh, so um, I'm kind of going to go stepwise through this uh, lecture. And, and the first one is you have to do a history, of course, right? And um, and the kinds of things that you're going to be looking for are uh, to look for things like headache, visual blurring, noises in the head, um, changes in the vision, uh, et cetera. You all know how to do the history. So I'm going to take you after the history when you're doing the examination, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today. So the step one is, is the question is, is it really swollen? Step two is going to be one eye or two eyes. Uh, step three is making sure you know what the visual exam shows, the visual acuity, looking for an RAPD, the fields, uh, and color vision, et cetera. And then uh, trying to determine whether this is true swelling or pseudo swelling, and then uh, work it up for the appropriate uh, condition. So this is an 87-year-old woman. She was referred emergently for papilledema. Uh, and the cases that I'm going to show you are actual cases that came into our clinic. She had an occasional headache, uh, but she wasn't suffering from any new headaches. Uh, she had a key, uh, no changes in her vision, except she's had uh, age-related macular degeneration. Her acuity was 20-20, She had no RAPD. She had a very small isotropia, and um, her visual fields showed a little bit of an arcuate scotoma here, and maybe at the start of one over here. And when we looked at her discs, a couple things were apparent. The reason she was sent is it looks like this disc is elevated, doesn't it? There's just a little elevation superiorly, and she's got this kind of subretinal hemorrhage around the optic disc uh, as well. Um, and it's a little bit hyperemic. And so she was sent for papilledema. So what do you think about that? Would you like to think about anything else? Well, uh, we looked at all the imaging. She'd been to the ER, so she'd already had an MR. She refused a lumbar puncture. Her blood workup was negative. And um, we looked at her imaging, and we really could not see any signs of uh, the disc protruding into the globe. We couldn't see any enhancement of the nerve. We didn't see any of the telltale signs that we look for, which we'll talk about, of high pressure like an empty cella or anything else to go along with uh, papilledema. So we uh, elected to do a diagnostic procedure. Does anybody have an idea what that might have been? An ultrasound. We did an ultrasound. And she had buried drusen. Um, so this case exemplifies that, you know, you can't just say, look at the disc and say, oh, well, it's elevated, so it must be papilledema. You have to think, okay, does she have a, a history that sounds like new, something new going in in her head or anything else? The answer was no. So the first question is, is it really swollen? And optic disc Jews, that I would say, really confuse the picture um, as one of the most frequent um, things that, that we can run across. It's usually inherited, it runs in families, and of course the word drusen comes from the German word uh, for the inside of a geode, uh, a drusen. And it's not hard to pick them out when they're really obvious, uh, and you see these little calcific bodies on the optic disc, then you go, oh yeah, it's optic disc drusen. Um, and uh, Brad and, and a previous um, medical student actually reported uh, that, that uh, when they looked at OCTs, one of the things that people have always said about Drusen is that the optic canal is, is more narrow. But in that study that they did, they showed that the canal is really not, is, is a normal sized canal. 
Um, so there are two flavors of Drusen. The easy one is visible Drusen, and uh, I like to look for the visible Drusen right with the direct ophthalmoscope by using the slip beam, or uh, which I can side illuminate the disc, or the red free filter, which helps bring them out really a lot more easily. But the ones that give us the fits are the berry Drusen, like. And so, so clues to anomalous nerves that this person had were that usually it's coupless. The disc is coupless. Now, a coupless disc can swell as well. But when you see a coupless disc, always think, could this be an anomalous nerve? The second clue is usually there are anomalous <coughs> vessels on the disc. Like here's a trifurcation. So these are, look at these. You know, vessels are very anomalous appearing because like all of them are coming out of the center. Uh, you can see these trifurcations and all that kind of thing. And if we go back to that lady, um, you can see she has a coupless disc and, um, and she's got anomalous vasculature. So when you see it, it doesn't mean that you can just say, oh, I'm done, I'll just get an ultrasound and I don't have to do anything, no. You may still have to do something, but what you need to do is just double think it and say, now, is this an anomalous nerve or is this a uh, real true swell? Okay. Um, the green filter is really helpful. Um, I mentioned the slit beam, and then, of course, our fluorescence. And here, the photographer can be your friend because sometimes uh, they can actually see it with color fundus photos, red free fundus photos. Um, autofluorescence really can bring this out. Um, even if they're buried sometimes, you can see it. And then um, there's a lot of work being done right now on OCTs, um, seeing little chatter lines uh, in enhanced depth OCTs to see the optic disc drusen. So um, uh, I think <coughs> if you suspect it, you can do that. The other thing that I, I think is so easy is a a quick ultrasound and uh, we've got them in there you just take the B scan and uh, turn the gain all the way down um, and uh, find the nerve first turn the gain down and then look for very juice and then just light up um, like a Christmas light the other thing is you can look on a CT scan um, usually they're not present on MR um, you often have to look at CAT scan because it's calcific and it's going to show up more easily on a CT scan. One of the problems about doing a CT scan is if they do the Texas toast variety, I call it Texas toast when they're the thick slices, you might just miss the optic disc altogether. Okay. Um, the other one that gets confused for edema is a tilted disc. And how many of you have seen a tilted disc? You know what it looks like. It looks a little bit like a cornucopia from Thanksgiving. Uh, where you know, you can almost imagine a cornucopia coming out and, and instead of fruit coming out of the end of it, it's blood vessels coming out of the end of it. And there are many different types of disc versions. Uh, you, can, you can see these temporally, they can be nasal, they can be pointed inferiorly uh, or superiorly. So this one's kind of superior, superior this one's sort of nasal. Uh, and of course, they are almost always associated with anomalous vessels of the um, of the fundus. So that's another thing to do. You could uh, even on, on CT sometimes you can see these discs have are inserted almost on the side of the globe uh, instead of just straight uh, at the apex, sort of at the globe. Now, another disc that gets uh, always called edema, and, and we see this every day in neuroophthalmology, is a neurologist looks in and they see a hyperemic disc. Okay, and um, attention to the tint alone is a tremendous source of error. So said William Gowers over in 1900, and he said if you pay attention too much to the color of the disc, you actually are, uh, you're going you're, you're gonna to be misled. Uh, more times than not. So these are just normal discs in people. They're coupless. As soon as you see a coupless disc, it should send out a little bit of a, okay, I gotta look at this a little bit more carefully. And, um, and then you can start to look for uh, abnormal uh, vasculature, and that can be helpful in helping you determine that 
you know, no, these are just little, what we call little red discs. But they're frequently confused for papilledema. And these are what we call the disc at risk for ischemic optic neuropathy as people get older or have hypertension and, and um, diabetes. Uh, they're also sometimes a little bit hypoplastic, meaning they didn't fully develop. So um, these are the ones that can be very confusing. All right. Now, this is another case. Uh, this is a 54-year-old man. He had blurred vision. He's had a liver and kidney transplant. He's been on some medications, prednisone, everolimus, mycophenolate, methimazole, because he's got a thyroid problem, too. He went to see his dentist for a filling, and the next day he had blurred vision, pain with eye movement. He was seen in the emergency room and was diagnosed with papilledema and sent to us. So, um, Here's his exam. He was 2300 in the right eye, 2025 in the left eye. He had a big afferent defect in the right eye. His eye movements were full. He had no cell. His visual fields were interesting in that they showed mainly a big blind spot in the right eye, but a little bit of central compression in the right eye. The left eye was pretty normal. And here are his fields, or his uh, optic discs. OK, so the first question we asked was, is it um, is it real edema or not? So what do you think about this? Do you think this is real edema? Yes. Right. Um, he's got pretty normal vasculature. You can still see the cup. And frequently the cup is the last thing to fill in true edema. So, um, but these aren't normal nerves, right? These aren't normal nerves. And what is it that tells you a little bit that this is not papilledema from increased intracranial pressure? What's, what what feature here? Asymmetry. Okay, asymmetric visual loss, and he's got an APD, and he's got um, you know he's got poor vision in the right eye as well, and the the nerve is swollen in both sides, but it's it is somewhat asymmetric. Is there anything else? Well, I th I mean I think the the fact of the matter is that I mean doesn't have any symptom of high pressure like headache or noises in his head or anything else. So um, this thing is uh, pretty sensitive here, isn't it? Uh, so we looked at his imaging, and um, there might have been a little enhancement of the optic nerve on the right, and he did have a few T2 flare signals. Uh, but, you know, he had no empty cell and no other signs of high intracranial pressure. And this case brings up the problem about terminology. Because um, the ER sent him for papilledema. And many people think papilledema is synonymous with bilateral disc edema. But we reserve papilledema for edema related to increased intracranial pressure. So if you don't know if it's papilledema or not, you could call it disc bilateral disc edema. You could call it bilateral swollen optic disc. The term papillitis is often used for inflammatory causes of optic uh, nerve disorders, like um, like a uh, uh, like an optic neuritis. Choked disc. You might hear that term sometimes. It's a very old term. It was used in the last century for uh, edema, papilledema related to brain tumors. Because the only way they could diagnose a brain tumor was finally if they had papilledema and they'd say, oh my goodness, the person has a choked disc. And it, it, it fell out of fever because the choked disc didn't tell anybody anything. Um, papilledema, I said, is used for increased intracranial pressure with bilateral disc edema. Optic neuritis um, can cause edema in about a third of the cases, but it's usually unilateral only. Uh, optic neuritis is usually unilateral. Neuroretinitis or ocular uh, optic disc edema with macular star formation or ODEMS is often unilateral uh, and it usually can follow some kind of viral uh, illness. And then uh, ischemic optic neuropathy is a swollen disc related to uh, usually AION, whether it's arteritic or non-arteritic. You will see a unilateral uh, disc swelling. 
Now, I think it's important to understand what we're really talking about when we're talking about a swollen disc. We're talking about mechanisms of axonal swelling. And, you know, this little cartoon, I'll take you through what this means. This is like a ganglion cell attached to an axon going, and it's, it's representing all axons that are going from the retina. You know, it's, it's a little wormy thing. This is the lamina cabrosa, which it has to traverse. It picks up its myelin behind the lamina cabrosa. And really, it's the, uh, there's a combination of the intraocular pressure but plus the intracranial pressure that plays a role in disc edema. So in increased intracranial pressure, when the pressure is uh, elevated in the intracranial space, it causes axoplasmic stasis, and that stasis occurs at the lamina cabrosa, and that keeps, uh, and, and, it, and it causes sort of the swelling uh, to occur. Now, in ischemic optic neuropathy, usually we think of that as something happening right at the lamina cabrosa, uh, and you have these toxic, anoxic effects or infarction. It's also going to cause axoplasmic stasis. So when you see edema, be thinking about it as like a, a axoplasmic stasis. Inflammation does something similar. And if you see hypotony, because you can see a swollen nerve with hypotony, where the pressure in the intracranial space is normal, but the intraocular pressure is so low that the axoplasm cannot flow, that'll cause stasis as well. So that's um, that's, these are the basic mechanisms of, of axonal swelling. Now the features of true swelling, uh, I, I always look for swelling of a nerve fiber, fiber layer. Now the way to do that is again with your red free light and or the green light is really helpful at looking at the nerve fiber layer. And I think one of the most helpful uh, signs is obscuration of the vessels on the edge of the disc just obscuration of the vessels because in true swelling, you're, that's, the axons will swell and then they'll obscure features on the optic disc. So this disc, for example, you can't even see where these vessels are. I mean, they're somewhere buried in, in, in all of this axoplasmic stasis. Um, looking for elevation, and, and ophthalmologists are really good at using uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy to see the 3D effect of true elevation. When you're using the direct, sometimes it's a little harder to see because you're monocularly viewing, but you can still see elevation. Even in this photo, you can see that this there's a, a rise coming up here. You can see that this is an elevated disc. Um, the cup is usually maintained till uh, later in disc swelling. It's not the first thing to go. And of course, we often like to look at the loss of the venous pulse, or I like to look for the presence of the venous pulse because it, it's a little bit of a good finding in that you kind of think that the pressure is not elevated, although there are cases on both ends where venous pulsations were present and the intracranial pressure was 300 or 400. Uh, so you can't completely hang your hat on it, but it's it's a, it's a helpful sign. The color I don't think is is helpful. Retinal folds I, I always look for those because they're helpful sometimes, but they're not specific. Like you can see retinal folds from a mass that's pushing on the back of the globe, right? And you can get retinal folds from other things, hemorrhages, a nerve fiber layer infarct. You can get that from. Uh, diabetic retinopathy. So they're not a completely helpful finding, but they're incidental. Uh, the patents lines are probably the most helpful. Um, how many of you have seen patents lines? Not a couple of people have. Okay, so uh, you look it, look at the edge of the next time you see a truly swollen edematous nerve with papilledema, look around the disc in the retina and just see if you can see these little, can you see these little tiny lines right here? They, they're almost like little um, stretch marks uh, that have occurred. And um, they're not as dramatic as choroidal and retinal folds. Um, they're not that dramatic. They're, they're much more subtle. But look for it the next time, because sometimes they're present. They can be helpful, but they're not always specific. 
Um, hemorrhages of any type can uh, happen with papilledema or with any disswelling. Uh, these are all four cases of papilledema, actually, but you can see preretinal hemorrhages, subretinal hemorrhages, nerve fiber layer hemorrhages, etc., and the same with cotton wool spots. Um, I always look at the macula with every swollen nerve to see if there's any uh, deposits in Henley's layer to, to help us understand that there could be a macular star present. Um, and then just to kind of review, how are you going to tell the difference between papilledema and other forms of disswelling like that piece that I showed you? Uh, the history, uh, headaches, transient visual obscurations, blurred vision may be present in papilledema, whereas this will be visual loss. Uh, visual acuity is usually normal in papilledema till the end, okay? Uh, visual acuity is almost always effective in, let's say, optic neuritis, AION. Uh, in papilledema, there's usually no RAPD unless it's highly asymmetric. And uh, in, in, in optic neuritis and ischemic optic neuropathy, an RAPD is almost always present if one side is more than the other. And, uh, and in papilledema, you may see no other visual field defect than just in a large blind spot, whereas in optic neuritis and ischemic optic neuropathy, you frequently have other visual field abnormalities, and both of these can cause pallor. Uh, so went back to that case that I brought up to you, the guy who had the liver transplant, a kidney transplant and all that, he had the MR, he had an LP, his opening pressure was 114 centimeters or 140 millimeters, and, um, and he was on Everolimus, which has been uh, shown to cause press, and methimazole, which has also been caused to sh uh, shown to cause disswelling. We stopped the drug stream with steroids, and then he went on a different Lymus drug, and he's done fine. But there are many drugs that can cause disc swelling. Uh, the Lymus drugs, uh, nasal congestions, congestants, the erectile dysfunction drugs, you should be aware of those, can cause EION. And then amiodarone causes kind of a toxicity to axoplasmic flow uh, and can give people swelling. It's not a true ischemic optic neuropathy. Okay, so now we've got a 22-year-old woman. Now, her headache's completely different than all these other people. She has had chronic headaches for three months. And she recently gained weight, and she's had some blurring of her vision, and she sees her optometrist, who uh, does not do any further workup, and so the workup got a little bit delayed. Uh, she noted some dimming of her vision, her acuity was down, and, uh, and then uh, she finally got an MRI scan, and then she finally got um, a neuroophthalmic exam, and she had an elevated pressure on, on her lumbar puncture, and she had bilateral uh, papilledema with pretty bad visual fields. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about hyperacute uh, intracranial hypertension as well. So papilledema is caused from increased intracranial pressure. And it's most commonly bilateral, but don't get fooled, it can be unilateral. I'll show you a case. It can be various grades, and I'll take you through all the grades. And it should signal an emergency. So if you really do diagnose papilledema, that's, you know, that person gets an MRI scan uh, and, uh, and a lumbar puncture or whatever we need to make, work up the, uh, the problem. But that, that's an emergency. You have to really get to the cause. You can't just sit on this. You have to, you have to move. Now, uh, Lars Friesan came up with a scale of the grades of papilledema. And so it's zero to five, and zero is minimal swelling of the disc. And now this is a woman who I saw, she had idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Her opening pressure was 340, so not, not low. And this is the amount of swelling she had, almost none. I mean, I would have a hard time saying that that was a swollen nerve, right? And even if you do OCTs, which uh, there's a beautiful article in IODS from 2012 that takes you through uh, OCTs and Frisan scales and uh, optic disc photos. It's really a nice article. Um, 
And but this is this is great stage zero. Minimal swelling, the nerve fiber layer, the axons are not that uh, uh, constipated, and uh, there's no vessel obscuration. The cup is totally present uh, and not obscured. Stage one, we call it the C-shaped swelling. Okay, this is uh, an, er an early kind of swelling, and the the nerves that are going to swell at the first are going to be at the superior and inferior because that's how the nerve fiber layer comes into the disc, right? Superior and inferior. And everybody goes, oh, there's some nasal blurring. Well, the first look, place to look is really superior and inferior and then nasal and then temporal, but that's how it, how it will swell. Uh, you can see these little folds in there. I just pointed those out for you. Um, and and uh, the temporal margin is usually normal and sharp, and that's why it's called C-shaped swelling, swelling, okay? And the cup is maintained to the very end. Now, in stage two, it's 360 degrees of swelling, okay? 360 degrees of swelling, but notice that the cup is still present. It's not, it's not completely obliterated in stage two, um, and there's very little vessel obscuration. Maybe some of these little itty bitty ones along the very edge are a little bit obscure, but uh, you can see most of the blood vessels uh, easily. Stage three, again, 360 degrees of swelling, and, and the, here the nerve fiber layer starts to look opaque, kind of whitish, more whitish, because it's really constipated. There's a lot of stasis going on. The disc may be hyperemic or not, but maybe could be hyperemic. And this is the stage where you see a lot of uh, vascular uh, obscuration at the disc margin. So if you look at the disc, you're going to just see that you can't see almost any of these vessels at the disc margin. You still can see the bigger vessels on the disc, but you lose the ones at the disc margin and the, the cup may be completely filled in. In this case, you can still see the cup, it's sort of blood. But stage four, the cup is gone. Obliteration of the cup um, and opaque, ves uh, you know, the, most of the vessels are opaque on this disc. There's often advanced hyperemia and vessels are, you really have a hard time seeing them. I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but there are some patents lines along this disc. Can you just see those little, they're really fine patent lines. Uh, but, so next time you see a really swollen nerve, look for patent lines. And then stage five we call the champagne cork swelling. This is chronic swelling that's been there for a long time. I've not seen this very frequently. Usually people get picked up before it reaches this stage. But I've seen this a couple times. Uh, this guy, had a shunt that malfunctioned, and he just went around like this for a long, long time. Um, and uh, again, no vessels are seen, there's no cup, uh, yeah, but it does really look like a champagne cork that's just sitting in the back of the eye. Now, how can you tell if somebody's had swelling in the past? And you can look for signs of, atro of atrophy or atrophic uh, swelling. And there, the you get this kind of uh, glial like look. It just looks fuzzy. I call it fuzzy pallor. Uh, and the other thing you can look for are high water marks. Um, you know, they look like little rings, like bathtub rings from, uh, you know, the dirty bathtub, okay? And, um, uh, but these high water marks can sometimes give you a clue. So if somebody comes in and they don't have a swollen nerve now, but boy, their history sounds like they could have had a swollen nerve, you could look for those findings. Uh, this was a case that was a real fooler for many, uh, for some of us. Uh, you know, the nerve on the right was almost completely normal. You, you could argue that there was just a bit of swelling here and here, uh, but she had this really swollen nerve on the other side, and she ended up being idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, uh, finally, somebody, we did a lumbar puncture and, and diagnosed this uh, as pathedema from increased increase pressure. 
Uh, the nerve, once it's swollen and you, the pressure is relieved either with medications or surgery or whatever, will then start to regress. And again, you can often see these high watermarks uh, once it regresses. And sometimes the nerve does become a little bit pale or have that little bit of fuzzy pallor. Now, I always think that the MR is my friend. It's an adjunct to everything that we do in neuroophthalmology, besides looking at the nerve and admiring it and, um, and looking at vision and all the aspects. The MR can be our friend as well. So there's just some things that I look for on every single patient that I suspect uh, papilledema. I always, I first look at an axial and I look to see if I can see the the disc protruding into the globe. I look for flattening of the back of the globe, and I look for uh, excessive fluid along the optic nerve. These are uh, findings that can occur with true uh, papilledema and high angiogram pressure. I also always look at the sagittal for an empty cella or a partially empty cella. And we can look for tortuosity of the optic nerve, uh, of the optic nerve and we can look for narrowing of the venous sinuses. These days, most people get an MR and an MRV when they're working somebody up for uh, idiopathic and cranial hypertension. Um, and we just did a study uh, that's in press right now where if you've got three of the four of these, you've got a pretty high chance of it being a uh, true uh, increase in cranial pressure. Empty cell up, flattened posterior globe, distension or tortuous optic nerve uh, sheath, and uh, transverse venous sinus stenosis. And if you have three of the four of those, uh, you've got a pretty good chance that it's raised intracranial pressure. Um, Roger Harry does a great job with a 30 degree test. Uh, in kids, for example, if they are brought in, and I'm, I, you know, you don't want to do a, sedate a kid and do the LP, I might do this first. If I'm not even sure if the pressure is up, I might get an a, a ultrasound because it can show barytrusin in addition to doing a 30 degree test to look for raised pressure. And the way he does this is he measures the nerve in one gaze and then he measures it uh, with the nerve with the eye pointing to a different gaze and that's called the 30 degree test that he's good at doing that. Now, just because you diagnose papilledema finally, doesn't mean you can sit back and just say, oh, I, okay, I got papilledema going on here. Uh, you've got to find out why. And it could be, there are many causes of papilledema. So you, you could get it from increased CSF production, and that can come from a choroid plexus papilloma, where these papillomas just start making CSF fluid, and um, that can raise the pressure. You can have decreased CSF absorption through the arachnoid granulations. Um, you can have increased venous pressure uh, from either thrombosis or stenosis. And you can have obstruction uh, through the normal CSF flow pathways through the aqueduct. Uh, uh, and uh, so you always want to be thinking about some kind of obstructive thing. And of course, everybody's worried about a mass lesion in the brain uh, and causing papillomyoma. How often do you think a papilledema actually occurs with a brain tumor? Less okay. Than 10%. Well, it's a little bit more than that, but it's like 20 to 30 percent. Um, uh, how often do you think papilledema occurs in somebody with documented intracranial hypertension from traumatic brain injury, and you looked at them every single day in the ICU to see if they are developing papilledema? That study's been done. Again, it's not that often, 20 to 30 percent. Okay, so um, if you, the um, a mass, the tumor is more likely to cause a seizure than papilledema. Okay. Um, now, I do want to mention glymphatics. Um, these have been known about for about 100 years. Um, uh, they are uh, sort of the lymph flow uh, of the brain, um, and they may play a role in stopping egress through the arachnoid granulations and cause more stenosis of the venous sinuses. Uh, the jury is out on this, um, about the venous glymphatic connections and 
what role they play in uh, intracranial hypertension. So now, when I think of papilledema and raised intracranial pressure, and I've gotten an MR and I don't see a mass lesion, I don't see aqueductal stenosis, I don't see hydrocephalus, I don't see anything wrong on the MRI scan, and the spinal fluid is normal, so it's not meningitis or encephalitis or any of those things, I am left with, is this primary intracranial hypertension or idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Or is this a masquerader that looks exactly like it caused by another uh, reason, okay? And so like secondary things like venous sinus thrombosis can present identically, identically with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, in addition, some medical disorders can look identical like hypoparathyroidism sometimes can present with raised intracranial pressure and papilledema. Uh, a rarely right heart failure, sometimes sleep apnea. We have seen iron deficiency anemia. You have to be really low on your iron, I mean like a hemoglobin of six to get it, but you can see it. And uh, medications, tetracycline, minocycline are really, really common. Uh, growth hormone, vitamin A, um, and uh, lithium. Uh, Norplant is kind of a um, uh, controversial uh, association, uh, as is Marina IUDs and some of uh, the other things like Lupron, etc. But there's a whole list of drugs that can cause uh, raised intracranial pressure. The lumbar puncture, as I said, is a must. You have to do it. Normal pressure is uh, less than 200. 200 to 250 is it's kind of like glaucoma, right? 200 to 250 is sort of like, well, borderline. And I usually say 250 is, is my normal cutoff. I, and I, sometimes I say it's normal even if it's 287. If there are no other findings, there's no papilledema, there's nothing else, they just have a raised ICP. Um, because there's so many things that can affect the pressure. If they're curled up in a ball and doing a Valsalva maneuver, you know, I mean, Nobody likes an LP, but you know you have to curl up in a ball, and you know you're kind of tense, and you're going, ah. well, you can raise your pressure to 300, 400. You by yourself, sitting here right now, could do that uh, if you wanted to, just uh, doing a big Valsalva maneuver. Um, you always have to look at the protein glucose cells. You can't just do the lumbar puncture and get a pressure. Sometimes uh, pressures are done in the prone position. It's pretty good, it's, it's uh, a few millimeters difference in the prone, you know, a little bit higher in the prone than on a side, but it's not that significant. And I always like to remember that even people with migraine and headaches can have a little elevation of their intracranial pressure. That's a whole other topic, but I'm, which I'm not gonna get into. So um, uh, I always, I don't worship the pressure alone, but I do, you have to do it. Now, can you use the loss of a headache from a lumbar puncture as a sign of intracranial pressure, hypertension? Well, uh, there have been studies that um, have shown in IIH that if you do an LP, about 72% of the people with true IIH do get benefit from the lumbar puncture. But chronic headache patients often get the same benefit uh, from an, uh, a lumbar puncture. And, um, and this uh, study that was recently published just this year showed that yes, a lot of people get improvement in the headache, but many people get worsening in the headache uh, right away. They'll get a post-LP headache right after they get the lumbar puncture. So it's not, it's not like a treatment uh, for a headache. Uh, you've got to do visual fields. This, I, I you know, I, I just want you to hammer that in. I had somebody from Wyoming call me about raised intracranial pressure, thought it was papilledema. I said, well, what did the visual field show? They hadn't done a field. They hadn't done a field. Okay, you've got to do a field. Okay, that, you cannot follow visual acuity in this, in this disease at all. You've got to do a field because the acuity is the last to go. You've got to do a visual field. 
Now, the types of visual field defects that you'll see are usually peripheral, okay? Not central, usually peripheral. Enlarged blind spot is probably the most common visual field defect. Um, and, then, and then you can see these uh, arcuate defects. You can see constriction of the field. You can see wedge-shaped defects. Uh, but but uh, uh, you've got to do a visual field. Now, what causes visual loss with papilledema? Well, if you've got really high-grade papilledema, you're at risk for losing vision. Um, if the nerve infarcts, you know, if you've got axoplasmic stasis, you're squeezing those little blood vessels, and you infarct the nerve, you're going to lose vision. And things, other things can affect the blood flow to the disc, like hypotension. So somebody who undergoes uh, renal dialysis and has wide fluctuations of their blood pressure, they are uh, at high risk for visual loss if they've got true papilledema. You can occlude your central retinal artery, your branch arteries. You can even get a central vein, a retinal vein occlusion. There was one study done on a, thing. a guy was in a car accident and he had IIH, and um, and they did a uh, autopsy on him. Uh, and what they what was shown was severe axonal loss in the peripheral area of the nerve, and the interceptors were normal. So the, the area that seems to be most susceptible are the peripheral portions of the nerve. And if you've got raised intraocular pressure, sometimes people call that the double crush. They're, you're getting it from one end and you're getting it from the other end. And then if they have buried drusen or optic pits, that's another thing that can make uh, visual loss more frequent. And then you know, folds and neovascularization, et cetera. And then don't forget, functional visual loss can also occur. What is there any? Are there any things that can predict visual loss? Well, a lot of recent weight gain, high-grade papilledema, long-standing papilledema, atrophic papilledema, papilledema that's been there for a long time, not recognized. That's a recipe for problems. Uh, delay in treatment, um, and then uh, visual loss at presentation was the most helpful sign in a recent study. Uh, that came out. Hypertension, uh, men uh, tend to lose vision more, especially African-American men, uh, often because they don't come in and get seen early enough. Older people seem to be at higher risk and people with high interocular pressure. Uh, a lot of the symptoms do not predict uh, visual loss, and for sure, the headache does not tell you whether they're gonna lose vision or not. Now, um, treatment of this disorder uh, is usually diamox, uh, but methazolamide or neptazine can also be used. And uh, you know, with diamox, you have to watch for kidney stones, anemia, renal failure, all these different things. The, all of you should be familiar with the IIHTT. It was the first randomized controlled trial with diamox versus placebo uh, in 165 patients enrolled. Uh, the average diamox dose was 2.5 grams. And this was mild to moderate visual loss. And they looked for treatment failure by worsening of two de decibels uh, in either eye. Um, and their primary outcome was a visual field. Uh, uh, and it did meet the primary outcome, just barely, uh, that acetazolamide plus diet was better than placebo and diet alone. Uh, most of these people lost weight, more weight in the acetazolamide group and their papilledema also got, grades got better. But their headaches did not, it didn't matter which group you were in, but the headaches stayed about the same. Um, I'm gonna skip headache uh, in this disorder. Um, but weight loss definitely has got, you've gotta counsel your patient on weight loss. Uh, and the best treatment for headache is probably a diuretic like acetazolamide and sometimes a migraine preventative or to pyramate. Uh, if they've got very mild visual loss, to pyramate can also be used. Um, it's a weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, but in a small, in a series with uh, animal models, it showed it lowered the pressure more than acetazolamide in this animal model. So I use this for people who have very mild, very mild uh, papilledema, but lots of headaches. I'll treat their migraines with the topiramate. Steroids, we really don't use those very often, except in unusual circumstances and all these other drugs just don't seem to work as well or are expensive. 
There are surgical treatments, and we're going to be undergoing a surgical uh, treatment study here at the Moran, uh, where we're looking at optic nerve sheath fenestration versus uh, venous or ventricular peritoneal shunting, uh, and looking at visual outcome versus uh, best medical therapy. And um, this is a nice review of the different surgical procedures, optic nerve sheath fenestration, lumbar peritoneal shunts, ventricular peritoneal shunts, and stenting. Stenting is where they put a foreign body into the vein. The problem with that is you're putting a foreign object into your vein forever, and, um, and that can lead to those. Uh, so it does, it does work in certain cases, and we have sent people for that. What I did want to make sure that you know about is fulminant IIH. This one is, you get a call, you've got somebody with papilledema, bad papilledema usually, and often they haven't been diagnosed early enough, and they've already got horrible visual loss. And um, the problem with this is that uh, eight out of 16 of these people in this series were legally blind at the end of it. So this is a, an ocular emergency. And we've got a protocol for this. If you diagnose optic nerve edema due to increased intracranial pressure, uh, ophthalmology is supposed to be consulted and we're supposed to be looking at the field and all that. If they've got field loss, they get admitted for a lumbar drain to temporize things and either sent for an optic nerve sheath fenestration or for ventricular peritoneal shunting. Um, and, uh, and if one doesn't work, uh, sometimes we try the other as well. Um, all of you know about novel, but there are handouts for patients on uh, pseudotumor cerebri and um, uh, several uh, in multiple languages. If you have somebody with a different language, they, you can still use it. Okay, I have a quiz in the last five minutes. I'm sorry to whiz through the back part, but if you have questions on this, I'm happy to take them. So I've got a few questions, um, and I'll give you the story. Uh, this is question number one. Is this papilledema? So this is a 34-year-old woman. She has chronic migraines. She's had them her whole life. And, um, and a neurologist looks in and sends this patient to you, uh, is this uh, papilledema? Uh, she has no dimming her vision, no TBOs, nothing else. Uh, is this papilledema? And you can say yes or no, and then put down, tell me what it is. Uh, this is a nine-year-old asymptomatic boy. He was seen by his optometrist for uh, school uh, vision screening and sent emergently for papilledema. And uh, is this uh, papilledema, yes or no? Uh, did you need to look at that some more? This is... Uh, 35-year-old woman who had transient monocular visual loss in her left eye, headache, noises in her head. Um, what is this one? Is this, is this uh, papilledema? No visual loss, no TBO, or, or just TBOs in the left eye, no APD. Okay, four on the left is a papilledema or a pseudopapilledema, and five is the same question. Okay, uh, so describe three tests that you would order to evaluate and work up papilledema. causes of papilledema, plus two medical treatments for papilledema, and then list two surgical treatments for papilledema. All my questions followed my objectives at the beginning of this lecture. This is really fast. I'm just trying to keep up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going very fast to okay. questions. Oh, is it too fast? Yeah. Do I need yeah. to go back? Uh, maybe. Yeah, okay, let me go back. Okay, this is the 34-year-old woman, chronic migraines forever. A neurologist looks in and says, 
sends her to you because wants to know if this person has papilledema. No other dimouts, no, no other visual symptoms, totally normal exam except for this like it looks like this. Nine-year-old asymptomatic boy goes to his optometrist. He just had a, screen, a school screening exam and um, and sent for bilateral path with you. And is it or is it not? And if 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 uh, and and maybe what it, what is it? If you could, if you could come up with that. Anyone? Or you're just looking at the disc. Five. Ready to go on? Mm -hmm. right, okay. Everybody ready? Okay. All right, and then all of these are just on one slide. Okay, are we ready to go through these? Ready? Okay. Um, first one, Becca, what do you think? I don't think so. Okay, well, so. First of all, we're only looking at one disc. We're only looking at one, but let's assume that they both look the same. I think um, it looks like the edges of the disc margin are, are, I mean, you can see the vessel is pretty clearly, it doesn't really look like that would be what to me. And there's, and there's a, it doesn't fit with the Coupless disc, anomalous vasculature, and the story is just, right. she's got chronic headaches and she's had them for ever and ever and ever without any visual findings. Okay, that's true. And do you know what this disc is called? Do you remember? Uh, a little, well, little red disc. Little red disc. It's just kind of hyperemic, coupless, little red disc. Okay, um, how about this one? Um, in this case, so I wasn't entirely sure about this one, but it doesn't, so although there's changes around the nerve, um, it's hard, I, I feel like I can see part of the edges, at least on the, in the right eye. The left eye, I can't see quite as much. I was wondering if it was like a hypoplastic nerve instead. Okay. So but I could see the vessel, the vasculature, fairly well throughout. Yeah. Can't really make out the color. And look at what this looks like footballs. You know, an optic disc doesn't look like a football. Okay. When you see football-looking discs, uh, then think something anomalous. Um, what do you? So do you think this is papilledema? No. Okay. Do you have any idea what he probably did have? Anybody? Drusen. He had very Drusen. Uh, these football discs, you see a football looking disc, man, get that ultrasound out and and look for Drusen. Okay? Um, but it's it's anomalous. I mean it's coupless. You you see all the blood vessels. They're, they're coming out kind of straight and he's got like trifurcations. I mean, here's a nice trifurcation right up here. I mean, once you see these anomalous vasculature, uh, funny looking um, uh, shape, uh, be thinking about um, uh, these, another cause. Okay, how about this one? Yeah, she's got, um, she's got asymmetric papilledema. 
you could see maybe a little bit of swelling over here, like the grade one. If you were going to grade this, what would you kind of grade it as? And you know, these grades aren't perfect. You know, it's like a, about, you know. Three or four. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, she's almost lost all of her big vessels, right? She's lost all of her little ones at the edge of the disc, pretty much. Um, so yeah, I would, I would uh, definitely think that this was kind of between a three and a four. It's not completely obscured all the blood vessels on her disc, but it's pretty close. All right, how about four? It's pseudocapillary, but so the vessels look really nice. Okay, and also <laughs> there are Jews in here. If you can see the, can you see the little, little. <clears throat> So, Drusen. Okay, how about this one? I would say that's papilledema. Okay, or yeah, for sure disc swelling, right? Yes, but, sorry. Yeah, well, but, okay. we were talking about papilledema. <laughs> but for sure disc swelling, right? Yeah, I was just going with the answer okay. choices. <laughs> All right, well, that's, that's good, okay. What about uh, three tests you would order to evaluate? So we can do an LP, an MRI, and a visual signal. Yeah, those are the three big ones. I mean, you, there are other things you could have said, but those are the three that you should always order. MR, and always do the MR first, then do the LP, but always get a visual field. So that should be ingrained in your head that you want to make sure you do that. Okay, um, how about three causes of papilledema? Do you have any? Um, you could have IIH. IIH. And you could have um, an intracranial mass. An intracranial mass, like a brain tumor, yeah. Right. Well, you can get help from your colleagues. Okay, so we're at the average. Like thrombosis. Venous sinus thrombosis, um, a, a, a hydrocephalus, uh, choroid plexus papilloma, um, aqueductal stenosis, uh, et cetera. Okay. All right, now we're back to are you guys participating? Yeah. Okay, two medical treatments for papilledema. Uh, acetazolamide, methazolamide. Okay, good. Acetazolamide, methazolamide, tapiramate would be, um, uh, could be a, a treatment, especially if they have low-grade papilledema with more headaches. That would be good. And what about two surgical treatments? Optic therapy, administration, temporal decompression. Temporal decompression? Subtemporal. Okay, it, you could do that, but do you know what that is? No. Okay. You take off your skull. <laughs> Isn't this a treatment that we don't do anymore? Um, so don't, you, we don't do that very much anymore. But uh, that's true. It's something that could be done. So our, the most popular things are ventricular perineal shunting, uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration, and I would say venous stenting would be another treatment that you could offer in certain cases, but you'd have to be sure that you know when the pressure is raised, it will collapse the veins, so that'll cause the venous stenosis. And so you want to make sure that it's a fixed venous stenosis, and that there's a pressure gradient across the vein, because you don't want to stent somebody that if you just do an LP on them or a ventricular uh, shunt, uh, that vein just opens up. You don't want to put a foreign body in somebody. I've seen people get stents and when they had um, severe iron deficiency anemia, there was nothing wrong with their veins. But it caused raised intracranial pressure, pressed on their veins, and then they put a stunt in. Well, she's got a foreign body in her vein for the rest of her life, giving her chronic headaches and all kinds of stuff. So, um, I don't want to do that. Anyway. Okay, good, good job.